Sabina felt as though Franz had pried open the door of their privacy, as though she were peering into the heads of Marie Claude, of Marie Anne, of Alan the painter, of the sculptor who held on to his finger, of all the people she knew in Geneva. Now she would willingly become the rival of a woman who did not interest her in the least. Franz would ask for a divorce, and she would take Marie Claude's place in his large conjugal bed. Everyone would follow the process from a greater or lesser distance, and she would be forced to play act before them all. Instead of being Sabina, she would have to act the role of Sabina, decide how best to act the role. Once her love had been publicized, it would gain weight, become a burden. Sabina cringed at the very thought of it. They had supper at a restaurant in Rome. She drank her wine in silence. You're not angry, are you? Franz asked. She assured him she was not. She was still confused and unsure whether to be happy or not. She recalled the time they met in the sleeping compartment of the Amsterdam Express, the time she had wanted to go down on her knees before him and beg him to hold her, squeeze her, never let her go. She had longed to come to the end of the dangerous road of betrayals, she had longed to call a halt to it all. Try as she might to intensify that longing, summon it to her aid, lean on it, the feeling of distaste only grew stronger. They walked back to the hotel through the streets of Rome, because the Italians around them were making a racket, shouting and gesticulating. They could walk along in silence without hearing their own silence. Sabina spent a long time washing, the, washing in the bathroom. Franz waited for her under the blanket. As always, the small lamp was lit. When she came out, she turned it off. It was the first time she had done so. Franz should have paid better attention. He did not notice it, because light did not mean anything to him. As we know, he made love with his eyes shut. In fact, it was his eyes closed that made Sabina turn out the light. She could not stand those lowered eyelids a moment longer. The eyes, as the saying goes, are windows to the soul. Frances's body, which thrashed about on top of hers with closed eyes, was therefore a body without a soul. It was like a newborn. It was like a newborn animal, still blind and whimpering for the dug. Muscular Franz in coitus was like a gigantic puppy suckling at her breasts. He actually had her nipple in his mouth as if he were sucking milk. The idea that he was a mature man below and a suckling infant above, that she was therefore having intercourse with a baby, bordered on the disgusting. No. She would never again see his body moving desperately over hers, would never again offer him her breast. Bitch to whelp, today was the last time, irrevocably the last time. She knew, of course, that she was being supremely unfair, that Franz was the best man she had ever had. He was intelligent, he understood her paintings, he was handsome and good. But the more she thought about it, the more she longed to ravish his intelligence, defile his kind-heartedness, and violate his powerless strength. That night, she made love to him with greater frenzy than ever before, aroused by the realization that this was the last time. Making love, she was far, far away. Once more, she heard the golden horn of betrayal beckoning her in the distance, and she knew she would hold out. She sensed an expanse of freedom before her, and the boundlessness of it excited her. She made mad, unrestrained love to Franz as she never had before. Franz sobbed as he lay on top of her. He was certain he understood. Sabina had been quiet all through dinner and said not a word about his decision. But this was her answer. She had made a clear show of joy, her passion, her consent, her desire to live with him forever. He felt like a rider galloping off into a magnificent void, a void of no wife, no daughter, no household, and a magnificent void swept clean by Hercules' broom, a magnificent void he would fill with his love. 
Each was riding the other like a horse, and both were galloping off into the distance of their desires, drunk on the betrayals that freed them. France was riding Sabina and had betrayed his wife. Sabina was riding France and had betrayed France. Nine. For twenty years he had seen her he had seen his mother, a poor, weak creature who needed his protection in his wife. The image was deeply rooted in him, and he could not rid himself of it in two days. On the way home, his conscience began to bother him. He was afraid that Marie Claude had fallen apart after he left, and that he would find her terribly sick at heart. Stealthily, he unlocked the door and went into his room. He stood there for a moment and listened. Yes, she was at home. After a moment's hesitation, he went into her room, ready to greet her as usual. What? she exclaimed, raising her eyebrows in mock surprise. You? Here? Where else can I go? He wanted to say genuinely surprised, but said nothing. Let's set the record straight, shall we? I have nothing against your moving in with her at once. When he made his confession on the day he left for Rome, he had no precise plan of action. He expected to come home and take it all out in a friendly atmosphere so as not to harm Marie Claude any more than necessary. It never occurred to him that she would calmly and coolly urge him to leave. Even though it facilitated things, he could not help feeling disappointed. He had been afraid of wounding her all his life and voluntarily stuck to a stultifying discipline of monogamy. And now, after twenty years, he suddenly learned that it had all been superfluous and he had given up the scores of women because of a misunderstanding. That afternoon, he gave his lecture, then went straight to Sabina's from the university. He had decided to ask her whether he could spend the night. He rang the doorbell, but no one answered. He went and sat at the cafe across the street and stared long and hard at the entrance to her building. Evening came, and he did not know wh where to turn. All his life he had shared his bed with Marie Claude. If he went home to Marie Claude, where would he sleep? He could, of course, make up a bed on the sofa in the next room, but wouldn't that be merely an eccentric gesture? Wouldn't it look like a sign of ill will? He wanted to remain friends with her, after all. Yet getting into bed with her was out of the question. He could just hear her asking him ironically why he didn't prefer Sabina's bed. He took a room in a hotel. The next day, he rang Sabina's doorbell morning, noon, and night. The day after, he paid a visit to the concierge, who had no information and referred him to the owner of the flat. He phoned her and found out that Sabina had given notice two days before. During the next few days, he returned at regular intervals, still hoping to find her in, but one day he found the door open and three men in overalls loading the furniture and paintings into a parked van outside. He asked them where they were taking the furniture. They replied that they were under strict instructions not to reveal the address. He was about to offer them a few francs for the secret address when suddenly he felt he lacked the strength to do it. His grief had broken him utterly. He understood nothing, had no idea what had happened. All he knew was that he had been waiting for it to happen ever since he met Sabina. What must be, must be. Friends did not oppose it. He found a small flat for himself in the old part of town. When he knew his wife and daughter were away, he went back to his former home to fetch his clothes and most essential books. He was careful to remove nothing that Marie Claude would miss. One day, he saw her through the window of a cafe. She was sitting with two women, and her face, long riddled with wrinkles from her unbridled gift for grimaces, was in a state of animation. The women were listening closely and laughing continually. 
friends could not get over the feeling that she was telling them about him. Surely she knew that Sabina had disappeared from Geneva at the very time friends decided to live with her. What a funny story it would make. He was not the least bit surprised at becoming a butt to his wife's friends. When he got home to his new flat where every hour he could hear the bells of St. Pierre, he found that the department store had delivered his new desk. He promptly forgot about Marie-Claude and her friends. He even forgot about Sabina for the time being. He sat down at the desk. He was glad to have picked it out himself. For twenty years he had lived among furniture and not of his own choosing. Marie-Claude had taken care of everything. At last he had ceased to be a little boy. For the first time in his life he was on his own. The next day he hired a carpenter to make a bookcase for him. He spent several days designing it and desi deciding whether wh where it should stand. And at some point he realized to his great surprise that he was not particularly happy. Sabina's physical presence was much less important than he had suspected. What was important was the golden footprint, the magic footprint she had left on his life and no one could ever remove. Just before disappearing from his horizon, she had slipped him Hercules' broom, and he had used it to sweep everything he despised out of his life. A sudden happiness, a feeling of bliss, the joy that came of freedom and a new life. These were the gifts she had left him. Actually, he had always preferred the unreal to the real, just as he felt better at demonstrations, which, as I have pointed out, are all play-acting and dreams. Then in a lecture hall full of students, so he was happier with Sabina the invisible goddess than the Sabina who had accompanied him throughout the world and whose love he constantly feared losing. By giving him the unexpected freedom of a man living on his own, she provided him with a halo of seductiveness. He became very attractive to women, and one of his students fell in love with him. And so, with an amazingly short period, the backdrop of his life had changed completely. Until recently, he had lived in a large upper-middle-class flat with a servant, a daughter, and a wife. Now he lived in a tiny flat in the old part of town, where almost every night he was joined by his young student mistress. He did not need to squire her through the world from hotel to hotel. He could make love to her in his own flat, in his own bed, with his own books and ashtray on the bedside table. She was a modest girl and not particularly pretty, but she admired Franz in a way Franz had only recently admired Sabina. He did not find it un unpleasant, and if he did perhaps feel that trading Sabina for a student with glasses was something of a come down, his innate goodness saw to it that he cared for her and lavished on her the paternal love that had never had a true outlet before, given that Marie Anne had always behaved less like his daughter than like a copy of Marie Claude. One day, he paid a visit to his wife. He told her he would like to remarry. Marie Claude shook her head. But a divorce won't make any difference to you. You won't lose a thing. I'll give you all the property. I don't care about property, she said. Then what do you care about? Love, she said with a smile. Love? Franz asked in amazement. Love is a battle, said Marie Claude, still smiling. And I want to go on fighting to the end. Love is a battle, said Franz. Well, I don't feel at all like fighting. And he left.